Hi, good morning, everybody. And thanks, Lorenzo, Alexander, and the other organizers for having me here. Okay, so, um, all right. So um, let me let me start by mentioning that everything I'm going to talk about today is um, a collaboration with different people and I will properly acknowledge all of my collaborators during the talk. Okay, so today's topic is a um, recent uh, project uh, that builds on the standard persistent tomology pipeline. And after describing this construction, after describing uh, uh, this new, you know, um, this new uh, pipeline, uh, I'll talk briefly about some of the applications. And then in the second half of the talk, I will uh, uh, describe, I will talk about a new ongoing project that kind of bridges between these new um, construction in topological analysis and some concepts from optimal transport. All right, so I'm assuming that most of you are going to be familiar with the topological data analysis and persistent homology, but let me just give a quick introduction anyways. All right, so, uh, mm, it's not moving, all right. Uh, topological data analysis is um, a relatively new, quickly developing field in computational topology, whose aim is to study the shape of data. And it does that by building, revealing, revealing shapes from data to find those features of the data that persist across multiple scales. And persistent tomology is the main tool, the main algorithm in topological data analysis that mathematically, let's say, formalizes this intuitive idea. And its pipeline works roughly as follows and roughly as shown here in the, in the schematic in the figure. So the input of the persistent tomology pipeline of the PH pipeline is, sorry, is data. And for me, data is always a point cloud. So a bunch of scatter points in some hidden space or more in general in some metric space. And uh, uh, persistent tomology then builds a nested sequence or filtration of simplicial complexes from data and each of these simplicial complexes is constructed based on the interactions of points in the initial data at a given scale, and it provides an approximation of the data at that scale. Then persistent homology applies the um, algebraic machinery of simplicial homology to identify the topological features of this sequence of this filtration of simplicial complexes. And the, thanks to a structural theorem, uh, we are able to summarize the output of the simplicial homology computations of the uh, evolution, let's say, of the homology groups of these filtration of simplicial complexes in a structure object called a persistent diagram. A schematic of a persistent diagram is shown here on the right-hand side of the figure. And the persistent diagram is just uh, a multiset in which each point represents a homology class, one of the topological features um, appearing, belonging to uh, a homology group of one simplicial complex uh, or more simplicial complexes in the, in the sequence. And the XY coordinates, the placement of the point in the persistent diagram gives information on the range of scales of existence of this feature. Uh, more precisely, the uh, X coordinate gives the birth, birth time, the parameter of uh, birth of the homology class in the sequence of simplicial complexes, and the Y coordinates gives the death time. Uh, please interrupt me at any time if you have questions. All right, so uh, again, uh, I know that many of you are familiar with these techniques, but regardless, let me just say it, um, persistent homology has been proven to be quite an effective way of summarizing the shape of data. Uh, and uh, here in this, uh, and has found like uh, very interesting applications in a variety of different, uh, uh, in a variety of different topics across uh, modern science. And here in this slide, you can see a list by no means exhaustive of some of recent, recent studies in pathology, neuroscience, ecology, and material sciences. Something that I find particularly interesting about persistent homology is its interpretability. 
And in my opinion, this interpretability comes mainly uh, because of homology generators, or in other words, those points, uh, those subset of data uh, forming cycles representing homology classes. So said in naive words, in few words, the subsets of data giving rise, creating topological features. Recent theoretical computational advancements in uh, TDA, in topological analysis, have allowed for efficient computations of these representative cycles of uh, these uh, uh, generators for homology classes. And this has the potential to uh, lead to a geometric interpretation of the abstract algebraic, algebraic summary of contained in a persistent diagram computed by persistent homology as structural features of data, even when we are dealing with very complex natural systems. So computing homology generators can provide important additional insights and is crucial to interpret again locally and geometrically the abstract algebraic summary provided by persistent homology. However, um, the, their analysis uh, um, comes with some major drawbacks, some major challenges. The first one, challenge one, is that homology generators are not unique. And this is true, you know, even if we just think about simplicial complexes and uh, the homology group of a, simplicial, of a single simplicial complex. Um, uh, generating cycles are representatives. So for each homology class in an homology group, so there are different choices you might make. And, uh, and this is particularly true in a persistent homology when a single homology class can belong to the homology groups of different simplicial complexes in the filtration. And this means that the fact that they're not unique means that their analysis might, might introduce biases, especially when, especially when there's no underlying knowledge of the system, of the, um, there's no pre-existing knowledge uh, on the underlying natural system that we want to study. Moreover, there really is no, you know, natural, simple way of uh, performing a preferred choice because, for example, finding optimal cycles under some, you know, definition, meaningful definition of optimality has been shown to be NP hard. And that means that, again, it's really not simple, it's really not obvious to understand how to perform a preferred choice. And again, this is especially true when we're working with real world data and we don't have uh, you know, necessarily a pre-existing knowledge of what we want to learn from the analysis or what to expect from the analysis. The, in, this, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this context, in uh, the context in which we are dealing with real world data, it becomes crucial to understand uh, which kind of information is contained uh, in, uh, in a persistent diagram in the generators and also in those generators that are often considered as noisy. So uh, I forgot to say that when describing the pipeline, but the distance of a homology class in a persistent diagram from the diagonal is known as its persistence or alternatively you can compute the persistence as the um, difference between that time and birth time. So in other words, a measure of how long it persists in the uh, homology class persists in the um, in the sequence of uh, simplicial complexes. So it becomes crucial again to understand which kind of information is contained in all the noisy generators and how to interpret and extract it. And this again is especially true in uh, when dealing with natural system and when uh, when uh, you know. Uh, persistent diagrams, diagrams might appear um, a little bit diffuse. So when there's no clear difference between homology, homology classes in a persistent diagram that contain actual uh, important information and those that might be considered as uh, true noise. So the second challenge can be summarized in how, how do we interpret complicated and diffuse persistent diagrams how can we capture information from noisy homology classes? And these two challenges, these two, you know, big questions, uh, are the questions that um, that drove uh, a recent project I 
collaborated with. And in this project, in recent collaboration, we, again, uh, with this motivation in mind, with the idea of trying to um, use all the information coming from a persistent diagram together with this geometric interpretation coming from homology generators, we developed HyperTDA, um, a pipeline that consolidates the information coming from a persistent diagram together with a choice of homology generators into a hypergraph or higher order network. And here on the right hand side of the slides, you can see my collaborators, Christian, Iris, Deborah, Michael, and Heather. Now, uh, if you don't know what a hypergraph is, don't worry too much. It's just, you know, it's the same as a graph, but edges can connect simultaneously more than more than one vertex. Our approach in this project uh, works schematically as follows. So the first part, as you can see again from the, from the schematic, from the figure, is the standard persistent homology pipeline. Then once a persistent diagram is computed, we computed, we choose, we compute one homology generator, one representative cycle for each class in the persistent diagram. Here in this schematic, I'm only thinking about homology degree one, so uh, cycles. Uh, and to be fair, for most of the for most of the talk, again, when I talk about homology, I mean homology in degree one. So if I forgot to mention it or to be specific about, about dimensions, just think about dimension one. Anyways, for each class in the persistent diagram, we compute a homology generator. And then we define the persistent homology hypergraph or pH hypergraph as the hypergraph having as nodes as vertices, the initial point cloud. And then we add a hyper edge connecting um, a hyper edge uh, um, for each homology generators, for each representative cycle, connecting all those points, forming, creating the cycle. Again, uh, it's easier to see the figure and, and understand uh, what's going on than to actually describe it. For each cycle, we have a hyper edge. And together, uh, by performing, a, uh, by computing a single uh, cycle for each homology class in a persistent diagram, we obtain this uh, uh, persistent homology hypergraph. And then we weight uh, each hyper edge according to the persistence of uh, the significance of each homology class of each topological feature in the persistent diagram. Now, this construction allows to move from uh, data to a combinatorial structure object containing simultaneously, again, all the information um, uh, coming from a persistent diagram together with a localization and inter geometrical interpretation of each homology class as a structural feature in the initial data in a combinatorial object, in a structural object. And we can then analyze this uh, structure combinatorial object using all the apparatus of network theory. And in particular, in our, in our project, we focus on two different kinds of analysis. On one hand, we decided to look at the communities in this hypergraph. Uh, so we were trying to find those densely connected groups of nodes that would correspond by construction to um, uh, functional modules uh, induced by higher order interactions between points. And these communities define a partition, again, induced by higher order interactions. And on the other hand, we, by using recent uh, recent developments, uh, developments in hypernetwork theory, we computed node centrality or in other words, a ranking of nodes based on hyper edge membership and significance. So again, uh, translated with a topological interpretation, the importance of a node depends on the importance of its connections in the persistent homology hypergraph. So it depends on how often it contributes to create topological features in the initial data and how meaningful how persistent, how significant these topological features are. Any questions so far? So uh, these are the two, again, the two kind of analyses um, I'm going to carry, 
carry through for at least half of this talk. Um, again, um, two-sided on one hand, we want to uh, find the partition of this hypergraph, a partition of our data, initial data, into these functional modules induced by higher order interactions. And on the other hand, we want to understand how topologically important each node in our initial data, each uh, portion of our, of our initial data is. And this can be quantified by computing centrality. Now, uh, I said that the first challenge uh, in uh, looking at homology generators is their non-uniqueness. And the natural question at this point is, okay, but you're still performing a choice. So is this, you know, is this actually meaningful? How much does uh, the construction and the analysis of this persistent homology hypergraph depends on the choice of uh, a specific choice of generator for each homology class? And our idea was that on one hand, by considering whole homology classes at once, rather than um, focusing uh, on a homology class um, at a time, the uh, choice uh, performed to uh, compute heat uh, generating cycles, the choices would some, the biases in, induced by the choices would somehow cancel out. And on the other hand, that you know, performing this analysis, so community detection and uh, computing node centrality, would again somehow work as a denoising process. So at the end of the day, the output of the analysis wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, depend so much on the specific choice. And indeed, we were able to see that persistent homology communities and centrality are first robust noisy data as it happens for the standard persistent homology pipeline. And more importantly, they're stable under different choices of homology generators. And something that we don't have in the paper, but we uh, checked afterwards is that indeed, um, these two, these two um, analyses, the output of this analysis is even robust for, uh, is, is even robust under different choices of filtration to construct. Different, different choices of rules to construct the simplicial complex. Obviously not, you know, uh, incredibly different, but if you are familiar with some concept from uh, persistent homology TTA, there are different kind of uh, rules that you can follow to construct the simplicial complexes that kind of, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, try to mini mimic the same intuitive idea and uh, the persistent homology hypergraph you obtain are very similar to each other if you um, change among these different choices. All right. Um, now, I told you that uh, by, by constructing this persistent homology hypergraph, we can maintain, uh, we can, you know, uh, analyze homology generators without, um, without worrying it too much. Uh, about uh, performing a specific choice uh, uh, to compute them or uh, without worrying it too much about you know which uh, which gen which, which homology classes we are considering. So the fact of kind of overcoming the two challenges two challenges that I mentioned. but is it actually useful? So are we learning something more with respect to the standard persistent homology pipeline? And very briefly I want, to just I, I just want to show a few of the applications we have. Um, in movement research, a recurring problem is um, to develop effective and unsupervised methods to identify units known as behavioral nodes. Now, here in this figure, you can see the XY trajectory of, um, of a nematode moving on an, ag on an agar plate. Plate. Each each point is like a position at a given time t, and then you know the curve shows uh, the uh, movement, the trajectory of this nematode. And here the points in this trajectory are colored according to node centrality values, with yellow corresponding to higher values and blue corresponding to lower values. And we can see that by looking at this node centrality, we can distinguish different behaviors in terms for example, of intensity of local searches, looping behavior, and relocation. 
Now, uh, in typical experiments, again, in movement theory aimed at understanding movements, for example, in cells or other contexts, the available data usually consists of uh, trajectories. And the problem, the challenge is to understand the underlying uh, random walk model um, uh, behind uh, you know, the, uh, the trajectory. And, and specifically, and in, in particular, maybe to detect and quantify possible biases, for example, towards uh, a specific direction. And in our work, we found that analyzing persistent homology communities, analyzing their geometric size, their length, and the interconnectivity in the pH hypergraph between the, these communities, these uh, groups of intercon interconnected nodes, is enough to distinguish between different random work models and to identify specific directional biases. And on this, uh, on this specific aspect, I want to spend just a few more words since this is a machine learning uh, seminary, uh, seminar and uh, you know, um, we have a kind of machine learning result I just wanted to mention. All right, so uh, this problem of this problem of guessing the random walk model given a trajectory is particularly challenging for anomalous diffusion. Now, anomalous diffusion is the transport, uh, the transport model where the mean square displacement grows nonlinearly with time. And it turns out that it's quite ubiquitous in nature. And uh, uh, again, understanding given a trajectory, the underlying random walk model is challenging in this context since uh, different models outputs curves with the same, different anomalous diffusion models outputs curves with the same scaling exponent. And this problem is so challenging that it has inspired the challenge, the 2020 ND challenge, that represented the first systematic effort to predict the underlying diffusion model from a, tra a given trajectory. Now, in our work, we try to see where what we could say using our our technique about these anomalous diffusion trajectories. And we saw that by analyzing persistent homology communities, we could detect model-specific differences across, uh, across uh, five different models, the five different models uh, studied by the Andy Challenge. And moreover, given the high interpretability of our technique, we could uh, translate these model-specific differences uh, and interpret them as local structural features of each model, regardless of the uh, variability in each model. And, you know, uh, happy about this result and um, inspired by this result, we, we, um, we constructed a very simple, very, very simple convolution neural network architecture to try and predict, given as input, uh, given as input the persistent homology hypergraph constructed computed from a given trajectory, we wanted to uh, predict the um, underlying anomalous diffusion model as uh, in the end the challenge. And we saw that we, um, even with a very, very simple uh, architecture, we were able to predict the model with high accuracy and we would have ranked in the, um, we would have uh, scored well in the ranking in the end the challenge, even if for us, you know, this was just a byproduct of our uh, our analysis rather than the main the main um, focus. All right, very quickly, I just want to mention the last more recent application of this pipeline, and then I'll move to this uh, topological optimal transport uh, context. So I think all of us have heard that deep learning methods have kind of revolutionize uh, our ability to predict protein structures uh, and uh, that AlphaFold 2 represents the latest breakthrough in this area. AlphaFold 2 has outperformed accuracy and volume of other protein structure prediction methods. And currently in the online database, uh, there are more than 220 million predicted protein structures, roughly you know, uh, these are across all kingdom, kingdom, kingdoms of life and roughly they cover almost, you know, the entire protein universe. And in a recent project, we decided to see what we could learn by applying uh, 
our topological data analysis uh, pipeline, uh, topological data analysis techniques to analyze those predicted structures. So together with these collaborators, and this project was led by Christian, uh, and then uh, in the project we have Stephen and Lucy, Lucy and Michael, uh, Douglas and Alessia. Um, so in this project, we analyze the over 200 million predicted protein structures using the persistent homology hypergraph. And I just want to emphasize here the contribution of Christian that really led this project. Um, you know, performing uh, such a large scale computation is quite challenging. Even just downloading and uh, curating the data set is challenging. Uh, let alone like performing these high level mathematical computations. So Christian has done uh, single ended, single endedly done an amazing job in uh, making sure that we were able to, um, you know, perform again these very complicated analyses on each of these two hundred million, two hundred million structures. And here in the figure you can see like a evocative uh, uh, representation of some summary. Uh, of the um, topological analysis we perform the protein universe. I don't want to spend too many words on it. You know, it's just uh, it's just meant to be kind of aesthetically pleasing rather than informative, but it should give an idea of the complexity uh, of the computation. All right. So uh, again, we apply the pipeline that I just mentioned. So for each of the for each of the two hundred over two hundred. Uh, uh, million protein structures, we computed their persistent homology in dimension one and two this time. And then we computed the persistent homology hypergraphs again in dimension one and two. And then we computed the centrality value amino acid by amino acid. So we had information amino acid by amino acid of how much each portion of this protein uh, was topological, of each protein was topologically important. And kind of amazingly, we were able to correlate topological importance with uh, uh, damaging variance. In other words, we saw that centrality values are much higher, much, much higher, and statistically significantly higher in residues accommodating structurally damaging mutations. So without any any uh, further knowledge rather than the 3D structure of a protein, we can guess where, whether a given, a given amino acid is likely to accommodate a damaging mutation or not. And points with high centrality values are very likely to accommodate such a damaging mutation. And uh, uh, similarly, you know, uh, similarly interestingly, we saw that we could um, correlate, we could associate the volume of persistent homology communities and more in general of persistent homology generators uh, with uh, um, uh, preference of a given enzyme, uh, uh, with temperature preference of a given enzyme. Namely, we analyzed, we analyzed uh, uh, homologous enzymes across different organisms uh, that might be thermophilic or mesophilic, so live in very high temperature or very low temperature. And even when the enzymes were homologous, so very, very, with very, very similar structures, almost, almost superimposable structures, the topological information contained in the persistent homology hypergraphs were able to find significant, significant differences depending on, again, the um, uh, preferred temperature of the uh, host organism of each enzyme. All right, I'm done with the I'm done with the applications, and in the last 15, 20 minutes, I want to again mention this uh, ongoing uh, ongoing project whose aim is to bridge between uh, um, some concept in optimal transport and uh, uh, topological data analysis. Let me start by quickly introducing what optimal transport is. Uh, so optimal transport is a far-reaching theory formalizing uh, various notions of distances between measures. And optimal transport has found in the, last few, in the last few years applications in geometry, partial differential equations, 
statistics and many other uh, uh, many other fields, often bringing substantial advancements in improvements over classical methods, especially when uh, um, especially when uh, combined with machine learning techniques. In its standard formulation, the Wasserstein distance formulation, optimal transport um, focuses on matching measures on a common metric space in a way that minimizes the total transportation cost. So if we interpret the distributions, for example, as ways of piling up the earth, piling up, piling up earth over a region D, uh, then the Wasserstein distance in this context, also known as the earth mover distance, captures the minimum cost of building the smaller pile, pile using dirt taken from the larger, where cost is defined as the amount of dirt moved uh, multiplied by the ground distance over which it is moved. Okay, so how much, you know, how much, how much does it cost to move earth from one distribution to another, move the earth from one distribution to another. In uh, topological data analysis and persistent homology, many, many people in the field are familiar with concepts of, with the concept of Wasserstein distances for persistent diagrams. And this is just, you know, an adaptation of the optimal matching problem in the Wasserstein distance setting uh, to uh, an opt optimal matching uh, problem for, pers for persistent diagrams. Um, and this formulation outputs a matching between homology classes that minimizes, minimizes uh, uh, the total distance between two, per two persistent diagrams once um, a way of measuring the distance between two homology classes in, in uh, uh, different persistent diagrams is fixed. Um, all right, uh, a more flexible approach than the Wasserstein problem is provided by the Gram of Wasserstein framework. Here in the Gram of Wasserstein framework, the objective is to couple distributions on distinct, on different me metric spaces through a cost function based on local structures. So uh, what we want to do is given to given to distributions on uh, distinct metric spaces, we want to find the matching, the coupling with, between these two distributions that minimizes uh, the local distortion. Again, this is uh, kind of suggested by the schematic. If we think about our distributions as being uh, two point clouds in some uh, Euclidean space, we want to find the, match the matching between uh, the two point clouds that minimizes uh, the distortion between pairwise distances, for example, again, as shown here uh, in the figure. So you want points that are closed in the first point cloud to be matched to points that are closed in the second point cloud. The Gram of Wasserstein uh, framework has been extended to the problem of comparing structure objects. So for example, graphs or label graphs or directed graphs. And uh, um, in this context, the output of the optimal transport problem is a matching between vertices that uh, optimally preserves the graph structure, where the graph st structure can be uh, given as input either by, I don't know, the adjacency metric or the path distance metric or any other notion of uh, distance uh, between vertices in a single graph. So again, you want to find in this context, you want to find the matching even to different graphs, you want to match, you want to couple the vertices in such a way that the graph structure is uh, optimally preserved. Now, the gromov wasserstein framework has been very recently generalized to hypergraphs um, uh, in a recent paper in which the optimal transport problem is called hyper-COT. Um, this hyper-COT, given two different hypergraphs, outputs a matching, a couple matching between vertices and edges um, that, again, is supposed to optimally preserves the hypergraph structure. And the important part here is that the um, we obtain instead of one matching, instead of one coupling, two couplings. 
one for vertices and one for edges. And these two uh, couplings are interconnected between each other. They uh, are the ones uh, simultaneously minimizing uh, a, um, a, a co-optimal problem. Any questions so far? All right. So um, I talked a lot about this persistent homology, persistent homology pipeline. And uh, another way of thinking about this pipeline is that the persistent homology hypergraphs is a way of moving from a point cloud to a structure object, a, a structure object hypergraph that captures the local and global topological and structural information computed by persistent homology. Now, this gives the idea, together with the recent developments in uh, optimal transport theory for structure objects, gives the idea of trying to define a um, topological optimal transport theory or you know, a transport theory on structure objects that kind of tries to minimize topological distortions. And that's what Stephen, Tom, and I have been thinking about for the last few months. Again, this is still ongoing, uh, so please be patient if, um, if details are not so you know, uh, tied up and do ask questions and feedback here are especially welcome. All right, so in the next few minutes, I want to quickly outline the pipeline of this topological optimal transport uh, theory of this uh, topological optimal transport problem, uh, explain how we ended up um, building, uh, building uh, uh, the theory that way, and then finally I want to show some applications, some examples. All right, so again, uh, our starting point is data, okay, and uh, data in the form of point clouds. So our problem here is that we want to define a transport theory for point clouds that again minimizes topological distortion. Now with the hyper TDA pipeline, we can move from point clouds to structure objects, the persistent homology hypergraph that again contain topological information, all the topological information computed by persistent homology. And given the uh, recent developments in uh, um, transport theory of hypergraphs, the first, the first natural idea, the first natural um, solution would be to try and use directly, straightforwardly use these transport theories, for example, hyper-COT on the persistent homology hypergraphs to transport point clouds based on the hypergraph structure and thus based on their topological features. However, this comes with a problem, namely, it's unclear how to accurately, accur accurately match edges, so topological features. And this is because, uh, you know, um, initially hyper edges are not weighted, so there's no way we can distinguish between important and unimportant ones, and it's unclear it's unclear uh, why we should only care about the hypergraph structure and not some sort of significance to match different edges. And note that weighting by persistence does not work in this context because uh, um, naively, um, uh, if, we, if we decided to weight each hyper edge by its persistence, uh, then what the, what the optimal solution would tend to do would be to split a highly persistent class, a highly persistent hyperedge into uh, low persistent ones rather than matching significant features from in one hypergraph to significant features in the other hypergraph. So it would tend more to split important hyperedges rather than match together important hyperedges. So this is not quite what we want to do, okay? We want to we want to um, we want to maintain the information about how significant each hyperedge is. And the second problem is that the hyper COT pipeline really only works for connected hypergraphs. And in topological in persistent homology, um, 
in persistent homology, uh, the, the, the persistent homology hypergraphs is uh, uh, often not connected, meaning that not all the points in the initial point cloud are going to be part of uh, generating cycles of uh, representatives, right? Not all the points in uh, a point cloud are going to um, contribute to creating topological structure. So let's see how we can solve these problems. A first solution to problem one intuitively comes with uh, trying to couple with Wasserstein matching on persistent diagrams. The Wasserstein matching on persistent diagram would tend to uh, match highly persistent topological features with highly persistent topological features. And we can couple the transport plan on the persistent homology hypergraphs with this information, or better, we can label each, uh, um, each um, persistent homology hyperedge uh, with the um, uh, as the uh, homology class uh, as the corresponding homology class in the persistent diagram and then create a fused version of uh, hyper cot informed by the vast time matching on the corresponding persistent diagrams a solution to the second, second problem comes with coupling, matching with the gram of Wasserstein problem on point clouds. So we don't want to forget that we are dealing with uh, point clouds, so objects that live in an Euclidean space or more in general in a metric space. So we have information about binary relations between points. We have information about spatial relations between points. And we can carry on with this information on one hand, you know, to um, uh, have uh, uh, information on how to move points that are not part of any topological class. On the other hand, to geometrically inform a topological driven optimal transport. So the, um, the uh, preliminary formula we have for our topological optimal transport theory is the following one. And it doesn't mean much if you are not into optimal transport, but just to, for completeness, let me say that the first term is just hyper COT on the persistent homology hypergraphs. And the uh, second two terms provide an interpolation between Ramo Wasserstein on the point clouds, so geometric information on the underlying point clouds, together with Wasserstein metric on the persistent diagrams again. So uh, the topologically driven matching between the uh, hyper edges, the homology classes. And the parameter alpha gives these interpolation terms between, again, these gramo Wasserstein on points and Wasserstein matching, uh, topological Wasserstein matching on the hyper edges. While the um, uh, first term is the thing that couples this interpolated term with hyper COT and uh, allows for a co optimal, a co optimal uh, interpretation of the problem. The output is uh, a couple, a couple matching, one with the vertices, a matching between points that is geometrically driven, is driven by the gram of Wasserstein problem on the point clouds, and is topologically informed because it's coupled with this hyper COT problem on the hyper edges. And on the other hand, it gives a matching between edges that is topologically driven, is driven by the Wasserstein matching between the diagrams, but is geometrically informed because it remembers the geometric interpretation of each homology class as a generator. And simultaneously, it remembers the geometric relations, the spatial relations between points, thanks to the Gram of Wasserstein, the Gram of Wasserstein. Um, uh, part of the problem. All right, and now I just want to show a little bit of the results, so showing that actually we got what we wanted. In this example, we see as a source point cloud this uh, uh, union of four noisy circles in, uh, in the plane, and our target point cloud is a flower with four petals, okay? And what we want to do, you know, what we want the topological optimal transport uh, uh, plan to do is 
roughly uh, sending circles into circles in a way that preserves the local geometric structure of each loop. Now we see here, here uh, points are color coded. Uh, so we have a color code for the source and then the uh, color code in the target uh, represents the matching. And we see that by using Gromo Bassetan, obviously there's no, there's no reason why we would, you know, um, recover the topological information, maintain topological information. So obviously the optimal, the optimal matching is just the one that preserves pairwise distances. So no, um, no uh, circle, no loop is maintained. And this is what we can do with TPOS for different parameters of alpha. So for alpha equals zero, the transport is uh, totally topological. So each loop is sent in each loop, but the pairwise relationship between points in each loop are not preserved. Each loop is like uh, sent in a diffuse way to each pedal. And if we increase the alpha parameter, then we get really these topologically driven and geometrically informed uh, matching, a geometrically driven and topologically informed matching. We see that here in the middle figure, uh, each loop in the source point cloud is sent in one petal. And moreover, the pairwise relationship between points in a single petal are preserved. So points that were ne next to each other in the blue loop, for example, in the source point cloud are next to each other in the uh, leftmost petal in the middle uh, target point cloud. A nicer example is a topology's favorite, uh, the uh, deformation of a teapot in a, in a, in a donut and in, of a mug in a donut. And again, here with two different uh, ways of coloring points, we see that uh, with our topological optimal transport plan, we can kind of recover the homeomorphism between the mug and the donut without knowing it. So the optimal, uh, topologically optimal uh, matching within points kind of mimics the uh, homeomorphism you can write down again without knowing. And then, so this was, these, the, the first two examples have to do with matching between the points, okay? Matching points, in two-point clouds in a way that preserves topology. The second aspect of our topological optimal transport problem is the matching between topological features, which is in our case, geometrically informed. And this is particularly useful when you have symmetries in a persistent diagram that makes different classes undistinguishable otherwise without some geometric information. Here in this example, you can see how by adding our geometric uh, our geometric uh, coupling we can uh, correctly match uh, um, classes loops in uh, uh, different point clouds even when their corresponding homology classes in the persistent diagrams are completely completely indistinguishable but thanks to asking that the spatial structure uh, is preserved we recover the right matching and something very quickly in a minute, in, um, this can be applied to um, track topological features in moving objects. Here in this example, I'm analyzing this uh, twisted loop, twisted spatial loop, kind of relaxing and unknotting as shown here by the schematic. And what we can do is track topological features step by step in this dynamical unknotting of the loop and we see that again, by adding this geometric, um, uh, geometric information in the, in the optimal transport problem, we can correctly track the evolution of topological features across uh, this simulation. And this is really everything I wanted to say. And I thank you very much for your attention. I